The Investments and Wealth Institute is proud to share a continued partnership with the Chicago Booth School of Business, now offering in-person education for the Retirement Management Advisor Certification. Expand your financial advising practice by demonstrating your ability to guide clients through the full retirement life cycle with the RMA Certification Program. The deadline to register is April 30th, 2024, so don't wait to join this in-depth program to become your firm's retirement planning expert. Register today at iwicentral.org slash RMA booth. We're proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. This series aims to help you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. Today, I'm joined by Steve Gresham. He's the managing principal at Next Chapter, and he recently wrote an article for the Investments in Wealth Monitor titled, The Retirement Wake-Up Call is here, and he joins me now. Steve, welcome. Thanks, Bob. Good to see you. Oh, it's great to see you too, Steve. Um, Before we get started, for the benefit of perhaps the very few people who aren't familiar with you and your background and your history, do you mind giving us a brief overview? No, not at all. Not at all. So uh, you mentioned Next Chapter, and Next Chapter really is a community that we pulled together right around the initiation of COVID as people were trying to connect. And what we wanted to connect on was the friction associated with retirement solutions. And so we were already working on that, but it just seemed to be the right thing to do to grab more people who were suddenly available and wanted to connect. If you can believe, you know, just a few short years ago that people actually wanted to get on a Zoom call, you know, even on the weekends. And, but what we realized though, is that we had to get after this in a much bigger way. You know, it was very easy for me to see it being responsible for the retail clients at Fidelity, the struggles that they had as they aged and they wanted to do so much of the stuff themselves, but as they started to get much closer to the brink of retirement, they realized how complicated it was. And that's where we said, well, next chapter is really going to be the simultaneous move of catching the consumers who are in need and then actually helping organizations find their next chapter of delivery, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes completely sense. Uh, You've also authored five books, which is uh, kudos to you. I've only done one. Well, you have to have a hobby of some sort. I I say to my adult children all the time, make sure that, that you're not putting all the pressure on either your job to make you happy or your partner to make you happy. You're certainly not your parents to make you happy. So you got to have something, and, and I just I, I found a, a good expression in writing. Yeah, well, I've written perhaps over the course of my career many books, but uh, and but only one book, and I wouldn't have I wouldn't call it a bestseller by any stretch. It was a worse seller, and I still think I owe the publisher money from my advance at the time. But uh, and I vowed to never write another book again until I wrote the marketing plan first, Steve. Yes, yes, that's the plan exactly. Yeah. So you wrote, um, speaking of writing, you wrote a a wonderful article for the Investments and Wealth Monitor here at the Institute, and uh, I'd love for you to walk us through it. My first question is, the article outlined several key challenges facing both consumers and the financial advice profession when it comes to retirement planning. No surprise. Uh, Can you expand more on why there is such a significant challenge, retirement challenge today, compared to maybe past generations? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. So maybe just as we kind of frame this, something that I I feel compelled to share is that I got on this topic because it's very personal to me. I was the oldest of four. I knew all four of my grandparents and three of my great grandparents. So I actually watched in real time the retirement process. And so for me, it it's just sort of a second nature discussion because I've been surrounded by older relatives and older people my entire life. My mother is still with us. She's going to be 90 next month. And I think what they would all say in response to your question is that the reason why it's so much of a challenge for this generation of people as they're retiring, and as you know, with your work and and mine at the Alliance, peak 65 is happening here in 2024, the most number of Americans to ever turn 65. And and certainly in history and probably in the foreseeable future. What my grandparents and my great-grandparents would say is that this generation has expectations beyond their level of preparation. And so they rolled fairly seamlessly into retirement, which is a fairly new thing because in the old days, most people didn't actually survive very long, 
much past that that expected time of retirement. So they had a plan, each of them. And when you have a plan, everything becomes manageable. The thing that I observe, again, with age contemporaries and, uh, of mine, is that if they have money, they're still not really emotionally prepared. You know, we, we make a lot of jokes, especially in my neighborhood, that pickleball has saved some of my friends. I'm not an aficionado. I've got other stuff that I need to do. But I think that's part of the issue. It's, it is the lack of preparation relative to very, very high expectations. That's what I think is the core of the challenge. And we can dig into that some more, but I think that's the headline. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, and I should mention, you know, we at the Institute, we're trying to do our part. We uh, purchased from the Retirement Income Industry Association several years ago, Retirement Management Advisor Certification. And uh, we're trying to help advisors get a better handle on how to help their clients prepare both financially and emotionally for retirement, as well as to learn how to manage and mitigate some of the risks that their clients will face in retirement. We could talk more about that in a bit. But sure. one of the things from my perspective, at least with the RMA and given your work at the Alliance, is this notion of creating lifetime income. Uh, and when I think about what's different about this generation versus uh, previous generations, I think of my own father, he had a defined benefit plan, uh, which provided lifetime income. Uh, I don't have a defined benefit plan and my peers don't have defined benefit plans. And many of them will have to figure out how to create lifetime income from their savings. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, again, my mother's going to be 90. Uh, she was in academics and in medicine. My father was in academic medicine for 45 years. She lives off of the monthly deposits that come from four TIAA annuities that were part of my father's benefit plans at four different universities, as well as the work that he did for the State University of New York, where he ran rehabilitation medicine. And so he's got a pension from that, you know, as part of the benefits package. So she gets five checks a month. Her primary objective is to make sure that her checking account balance is higher at the end of the month than it is at the beginning of the month, and everything else can be fine inside of that. But it's that total that I think my, again, my grandparents, great-grandparents would say, my parents never lived beyond their means. It was not how to fund a lifestyle that they sought. It was, here's how much money we have, what can we do with it? And, and I'm not sure most people approach it that way. Uh, no, and I, uh, and I'm I'm afraid I think there are a lot of things to blame for it, and and this notion of consumerism and easy credit in our country haven't helped over the years, and it's become more fashionable to brag about the um, the car that you bought than the savings in your four hundred one k. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. So you mentioned the problem of scale and how the current advisor to client ratio makes it makes effective retirement planning very difficult. Um, what specifically needs to change in the advice industry's business model to improve that ratio? Yeah, so the scale of the challenge is difficult, right? So we talk about you know, actively the 70 million remaining uh, baby boom generation uh, folks. And if you look at who's actually got money and who's trying to engage with the financial industry, I think it's a question of design. You know, the, the current financial services industry, especially the advice industry, was created in the image of boomers who are saving and investing for the future. That was a very long off kind of a uh, long way away, kind of fuzzy objective. And we're just not geared right when you look at the way practices are structured across the industry. So if you look at very, very high touch models like family offices and some of the best uh, RIA firms, private client groups, you know, there's a smaller ratio of clients to advisors. But then you have on the other side, extraordinary popularity and industry game-changing scale that's being driven at Fidelity in particular, followed by Schwab, Vanguard, and then some of these other models on the outside of all that. The difficulty when you blend it all is that even though people keep their stuff in more than one place usually, there isn't enough advisor time and attention available to people because, again, the industry was created primarily to help you invest and to save and invest and to save. And so you're sending in checks. There's a very, very different structure if you have 150 households in that average full service advisor book and then try to figure out how you're going to deal with three generations working around a central retiring individual or a couple and all the complexity that goes with retirement and then trying to figure out not only how you're going to 
enjoy that retirement, but how are you then going to transition into those later stages of retirement, which is really the battle for your, battle for survival, because that becomes now your primary goal as you try to outlast your longevity. Yeah. And I happen to think maybe the client advisor, uh, advisor to client ratio it, is difficult in part because it, this is a very labor and retirement income planning to me is very labor intensive compared to planning for retirement. Planning for retirement to me seems to suggest here's what you have, here's what you need, here's how much you need to save, and here's your expected rate of return in order to create the nest egg that you want. Retirement income planning introduces so many more topics, whether it's Social Security or Medicare or health care, long-term care planning or risk mitigation, et cetera, et cetera. It just becomes that much more complicated and to me becomes a what I often describe as a row and column exercise, right? That it's not, you can't use off-the-shelf shrink wrap software to create someone's retirement income plan. It, it's, it's a much more thoughtful, involved, labor-intensive process. Oh, I think you're exactly right. And, and you know, you're an authority on this. As you try to describe this to advisors who have been primarily trying to figure out how to outperform and limit volatility, that's a fairly single-minded approach. It's it's all encompassing, and it's one that you should be focused on. And if you do a good job of it, then that's terrific. And there's a lot of tools to help. You know that that portfolio approach. The difficulty, as you said, is when you start to deconstruct it all. So now, how are you going to spin this thing out? This is the first generation of people that has multiple accounts. So the only reason my parents have multiple accounts in retirement is because they work for multiple universities, and so that's why they had the plans. But lots of people have, have had several jobs and several companies, and in between the time that my folks were earning and where we are today, people have had 401ks, they've got IRAs, they've got IRA rollovers, they've got bits and pieces all over the place. And one of the most important questions that people ask is, which, which account do I take the money from first and then next? You know, I remember we did an idea screen at Fidelity a number of years ago, and that topic ranked right up there, tied for first with account security. So that's how much it's on the minds of the people. So, so for advisors, I find, and, and I think in your article, you note that many are, are uncomfortable having difficult conversations with clients around health and family and, and end-of-life discussions or longevity planning. What can the industry do to better prepare and train advisors? I mean, obviously, the IWI is trying to do its part, but mm-hmm. what 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 beyond that, perhaps, can we do to better prepare advisors to engage clients more effectively around these topics? Well, you know, I don't think there's any substitute for it, so I might as well just say it. Since I said that, you know, I, I knew all four of my grandparents and three of my great-grandparents, you have to normalize aging. And as a, as an, as not only as an industry, but as a country, as a society, we just don't. We just don't. There is, there's a stigma associated with being old that comes not from financial advisors so much as it comes from the clients themselves. So if you ask people, are you really prepared? I mean, how many people who have a 90-year-old mother like mine would have been talking to her 20 years ago about what she would be doing when she was living alone, perhaps, or when she was unable to live independently, which is the situation she's in now. She didn't like the conversation at the time. In fact, she was pretty hostile. She used uh, inappropriate language, I can tell you that. But my father, on the other hand, said, yeah, I understand. And even though it was their work for the both of them to understand and appreciate it when it came to themselves, they had a difficult time. My dad was okay with it. My mother, not so much. And she's still very independent, but she's in an appropriate place to live, which is great. So I think the most important thing is to normalize it. That's a societal thing. That's a company thing. that's, that's, That's just a people thing. But the other part is that we also have to give advisors very, very simple paths to follow. Something that that we realize in our work at Next Chapter and my colleague Suzanne Schmidt, uh, who manages the family conversation, you know, which is really what you're talking about. What she says is it all starts with having a really good relationship with Generation Two, which I think makes it an awful lot easier for advisors. So, you know, CEO of an advisory firm I talked to the other day, he said we actually like a lot better the idea of bringing the issues of retirement and longevity and the complexity of it and some of these more personal issues like unexpected health care events, and, and, which are really not unexpected by the industry, but they're completely unexpected by the people who suffer from them. And so they like this idea of talking to that generation two person 
And just because of where the demographic has gone, you know, the median boomer is now 69 years old. So you got half that population is older than that. So there's a lot of issues of health that are coming up. But those, those moments that happen, or what Suzanne calls the moments that matter, when those moments happen, it then creates an opportunity for engagement with the most responsible children of that person or that couple. That's the magical moment, I think, for, for the industry is helping support advisors to understand all the benefits of engaging with Generation 2. They're already making an awful lot of the decisions today, just like I make a lot of the decisions for, on behalf of my mother. Yeah. So, you know, I've coined this term, uh, a whole family approach, which maybe encompasses generation one, two, and three, which is maybe you're the, the boomer adult. You've got an elderly parent, as in your case. You might have caregiving duties. You might need to understand uh, how they want their the end of the years to go, what kind of living facilities they may want, et cetera, et cetera. But you may also be raising children, perhaps they're adult children, and you've got issues perhaps around that as well. But for the advisor to include the whole family in the discussion, to me, either in the form of a family meeting or separate meetings, to me is is important. One one to maintain the assets in the fam in your in your business, but also so that everyone gets on the same page within that family. Yeah. So um, now I'm thinking about my father working with a lot of of uh, clients who was someone had suffered a stroke or something and. And, and he would tell the stories about it, how if it was, in his calculus, if it was a single child of the person, and let's say the person uh, had a partner or spouse, if there was just one adult child, he said, those were the easy cases. He said, if, but the, every time you added another adult child, it doubled and then tripled the problem. So if you had a couple that had actually made it worse, and he said and there was always somebody when there was three or four or five, somebody coming in from left field at the last minute to change everything and, and just probably trying to right all the wrongs of the family's re relationship with that person over the years. So it's a very complicated situation. And so all that much more reason to be working with Generation 2 that can help codify some of those issues because... If, the, if it is the couple themselves and they're trying to project their own values onto that next generation without that generation's participation, all they've done is light the fuse on a bomb for a financial advisor. So you mentioned the seven moments that matter. You list them in the article that you wrote for The Monitor. Uh, maybe you could walk us through one or two examples of how advisors can tangibly support clients during these moments. Yeah, so maybe first we'll provide a little bit of context for what these are. So the, the seven moments that matter are the moments that we found, primarily life events, in the work that we've done over the years, because we've been at this family conversation thing since 2015, so it's, it, it tracks way back, and, and you know it's, it's been a journey. So what we find is that these are the moments where something happens that basically stops the traffic for the family. And what I mean by that is, I'll give an ex as you said, uh, Bob, an example is an unexpected health event. And that is the most common, right, of the seven moments. And there are a bunch of others in there like elder fraud and abuse, uh, particularly financial, which also means uh, information seizing of some kind or theft. Uh, there's gray divorce. There's unexpected cost for care. And then there is, can I live by myself? And there's a bunch of other things. So, but those moments are the ones that create rallying points for the client. But the way that we've realized is that they create reactive opportunities for the advisor or the advisory firm. You want to be conversationally proficient in these things. You do not have to solve them. You mostly have to be available. And so it, it's kind of like going to a, the, the, the parallel would be if you're going to a fancy resort, you've saved all this money, you, you're going there, you have high expectations, it's going to be great, and the person at the desk says your room's not ready or come back tomorrow. And you can't do that. So if there's an unexpected family event, a uh, healthcare event, and it, someone in the family is calling the advisor, this is the way we talked about it with some of our colleagues at, at Raymond James when we worked with uh, Amanda Stahl and, and uh, Frank McAleer last year. And we found that, that if the clients are calling in, a lot of times the person calling in is not actually the primary client because something has happened to the primary client. And now that person who probably doesn't know the advisor very well, and we all have stories about 
the lack of engagement there, because that's so important. So somebody is calling. They're not really sure what they're going to hear on the other end of the phone when they pick it up, because this is a phone call, by the way. This is not necessarily an email. Oh, you know, Frank had a uh, uh, stroke last week, and I'm not really sure what to do. So someone's going to call. They don't really know what you're going to say. And then, as, as my colleague Suzanne says, there's a shelf life to the response. And if you can't find a way to understand, be empathetic enough to understand that the call itself was very difficult for the person to make, you're in trouble already. And that's the stuff that resonates with this Gen 2 contact that we're talking about. Gen 1 clients are not often fired very often, um, and but Gen 1 advisors are. And Gen 1 advisors, though, are not fired by Gen 1 clients. They're fired by Gen 2 clients. So this is where it happens. So family health events, a big one. And then that immediately sets into motion questions about who can actually make decisions. And a very, very good example of this was in COVID, where if that primary household contact for the advisor, if that person went into a hospital and was locked down, no one could get to them. So you couldn't make any decisions on their behalf if you didn't have the appropriate papers. So power of attorney, trusted contact, all that. And most people don't. So that's where we started. You can just you can extrapolate from there how quickly the wheels come off the cart if you haven't gotten your act together around, well, can I live in my home, my mother's sole, sole issue of the seven moments? Can I live in my own home for as long as I want? You know, I, I think about, you mentioned trusted contacts. I'm sort of uh, aghast at how few advisors, it's not required, right? It's sort of suggested by the various authorities, SEC, FINRA, et cetera, state administrators. Um, the the prevalence of a trusted contact within the firm seems to be lacking. Is that, do you see that too? Yeah, unfortunately. So I spent two years on the uh, CIFMA private client committee uh, working on trusted contact. And I really couldn't understand the what I referred to, and, and I will refer to it again, it may not be politically appropriate, but I think it's naive for a, a financial advisory firm of any size, and these are the biggest uh, in the industry. I think it's incredibly naive not to have a, a some level of responsibility that the firms will be held to, to make sure that the clients do not harm themselves. You need today more paperwork for sending a minor child on a Ferris wheel at the local fair than you do to put a $20 million client in a position where they may not be able to make good decisions and actually may be of limited capacity to do that. We have to be able to help these people help themselves. And part of it is just being incredibly realistic about the humanity associated with people getting older. That's part of what I mean by normalizing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in the article, you, you have a, a chart, a bar graph that looks at the issue of cognitive decline or, and people's fear of suffering from it. It's uh, remarkable, quite frankly. Yeah, the speed with which this is going to happen. Again, this is normal, right? So if you look at the article, it's the, what I refer to as the new S-curve. And I used it in a conversation you know, at the Tiburon CEO Summit back in December. And it's, it's my go-to slide because... It shows the trouble that's ahead. And again, you know, we talk about moments that matter. If you have money and something happens to you as a result of being older and it happens to you, to your physical person, you, you probably have advantages in being able to take care of that. Knee replacements, other things, you know, that's, that's really not as spooky as if something happens to your ability to stay independently thinking and being able to care for yourself. Relative issues of aging all pale when we start talking about cognitive decline. And it is so prevalent, and it is almost no one that doesn't know somebody intimately. My mother-in-law died of Alzheimer's. I had two of my great-grandparents died of Alzheimer's. I see it everywhere we go in our world, and it's just every place. So I just I find it absolutely amazing for people to believe that they can have a retirement and look forward to their longevity and not recognize that there is a possibility that Mother Nature has a plan and it and it doesn't necessarily mean you can do everything yourself. Yeah. By the way, I'm nine weeks post-op total knee replacement. So it's <laughs> we just experienced it. The, the other thing I'd make mention of is I, I quote Michael Finka's study all the time from 13 plus years ago, I think, where he looked at financial numeracy 
uh, and 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 uh, decision making. And as people's numeracy decline, perhaps due to cognitive uh, decline, um, that their confidence in their decision making stayed uh, level, which to me means that they were becoming increasingly more confident about the bad decisions that they were making as they aged. And uh, and if that's the fate that awaits all of us, we better be making decisions now to accommodate our older selves, I guess, right? Yeah. And again, you know, this is, as I said before, you know, one of the reasons why I think Suzanne has got this right on about engaging with Generation 2. If the, if the cognitive problems, especially if they're quite severe for your client, let's say in the financial advisory world, if, they, if your primary client has got severe cognitive issues that develop, and it only goes one way, by the way, which is one of the reasons why I think more and more regulation is headed our way than less, because right under the, the old rubric of know your client or know your customer, if you know that they are suffering in some form of a cognitive decline, it doesn't get any better. So you've got to be able to check in and, and have some accommodation for that. But again, back to the issue. If somebody has a cognitive decline, at a certain level, it actually is not really their problem. It becomes almost immediately the generation two, you know, the responsible children, becomes their problem. And that's why being able to engage with them, having them know where to go if and when something happens is so critical. Yeah. Before we move on, someone asked me uh, at a speech I gave last week when I was talking about cognitive decline, they said, what about the issues, not so much when your client has cognitive decline, but what happens when your advisor or someone on the advisor's team has cognitive decline and is not doing right by the client? Yeah. So I've so because I've been around for so long, I've had this experience as well. I've seen it in a few places. And I remember many years ago having to deal with an advisor at the firm where I was an executive. And we had to talk to the advisor because he had discretionary authority, trading authority over clients' accounts. Now, this was in the late 80s, and that's that was an unusual thing at the time. But it was very important because we realized his level of cognitive decline was enough that he, he was uh, prevented from driving anymore. So if you want to see what that, would, that little nugget would look like in arbitration, it would be brought by the children who, of some client who would say, wait a minute, you gave discretionary trading authority to an advisor who's not even allowed to drive. So how does that work, Mr. Gresham? So, so it's a very difficult thing. And because, as you point out, uh, so many advisors are now rolling into that age bracket where it would not be unusual. And, and again, you know, the, one of the old sayings was, have you ever attended a broker's retirement party? I mean, it's a great job to hang on to if you want to. And, and I know a lot of advisors that are that are as old or older than their clients. And they don't want to give it up just like a lot of people wouldn't want to give up their job. It is an area that the industry needs to have significant scrutiny over because, again, just based on the demographic, it's not just for the clients or just for the advisors. Everybody that is aging, this, this what I would call degraded longevity, is, uh, is not far away. Yeah. Speaking about a job for life, years and years ago, I got to interview a gentleman named Winslow Weber, who worked at Moores and Cabot in Boston. You may recall the sure. firm name. He was a stockbroker in 29 during the crash oh my and God. still a broker in 87 during that crash. And, and his advice to me about stock market crashes were that these things go in cycles. <laughs> nice. Nice. That's fantastic. <laughs> Great advice. Um, let's move on. You, you mentioned in the article uh, some survey data on the communication gap between advisors and clients on the topics like annuities and portfolio allocations strategies. Why does the gap exist and how can it be bridged? Yeah. So you're referring to what we were, what we call the PRIP study at the Alliance for Lifetime Income, which is just a fantastic organization. And, and because the Alliance is focused on trying to help the consumer empower themselves for a better and protected retirement, you know, they're helping advisors to see what's really in the head of the consumer. I think this one, you know, and you would know it as well as I would, Bob, I think this one's a, just a, a communication issue. I think it's semantics. But it's it's growing, and that's the part that I think is tricky. So advisors focused on stuff that they think clients should be worried about usually reflects the, the advisor's own areas of expertise. You should be concerned about the markets. To your point about the stockbroker from Moores and Cabot who, who made it through 60 years worth of, of markets, it's the same kind of thing. They know that there's going to be a recovery. It's a long-term thing. 
ordinary people who don't live in our industry just don't feel that way. They don't have that perspective. Therefore, they don't have that level of confidence and they're anxious. And so if you tell them, well, studies say, they said, yeah, but I'm not in the study. You know, it's my account. And so what somebody would say is, is a great long-term capability and we should really stay invested and that always works out. Yes. However, you know, we can come back and say, well, you are aware of sequence of returns risk. You know, that's advisor language. Client language is if I'm 65 and I go to take my money out of my retirement account, and the market goes boom the next day. That's not good. I sometimes think of it as we talk about in the in the world, the law of large numbers. But for the client, it's the law of one number. It's their number. Right. That's exactly that matters. Right. Yeah. So uh, what about this? Uh, in, in the article, you also mentioned a, a lack of systems and technology uh, as barriers to supporting advisors more fully. What what can be what 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 capabilities are missing uh, that needs to be Im implemented or systems or solutions? Well, I think you've highlighted most of all of the needs. And that's really what we're talking about here is that systems and technology are really there to make things either more dependable and more process oriented. So we make sure we don't miss anything. So first and foremost, we have to make sure that we're catching some of these issues, some of these, I think, quite predictable moments that matter, if we can see some of those in advance about where those are going to be. Now, the issue there is, who's going to log that? So there's information that has to go into, presumably, a CRM of some kind. I'm starting really basic here. But not every advisor uses those capabilities. And when you get into the retirement world, now you actually have to keep track of some dates, or they start costing you money, or they start costing you time or trouble. And so whether it's eligibility for Social Security or making your decision around Medicare, some of these things are time stamped and you have to deal with it. Now, that sounds like a really simple thing, but unless we are on the ball proactively in communicating with clients, if we miss any of those dates and we don't have conversations with them, we know from industry research, you mentioned the gaps before, this is one of the biggest gaps. I don't know that my advisor is looking at it, so I'm not sure they're on it. Therefore, maybe I need to talk to somebody else because my friend's advisor called them about it, and that's where it starts to get around. The other part, I think you also referred to earlier, Bob, because it's, it's really about the management of the accounts. So there is software that is available that will help you tax optimize the withdrawal from different retirement accounts. There is software and capabilities available for you to manage in a more tax efficient way. And there's lots of software and planning stuff available for you to household multiple generations of accounts and optimize for the results inside of that. We then run into the other point, which is it's there, but it's not being used. So we make a joke in next chapter that adoption is the new innovation. So there are these capabilities that are out there, but we see time and time again that a bunch of clients have them and a bunch of clients don't. Well, why is that? And so there's a, I think there's a challenge for advisory firms about whether or not the agent-based system right, that I'd refer to of the individual advisor creates one level of service and if another agent or another advisor doesn't use those same capabilities, then it's a different level of service. That cannot happen inside of the same firm. That's a, that's a terrible value proposition challenge. Yeah. So uh, with respect to systems, there are a couple of things that I, I observe, and I'm curious for your opinion. One is, in, in some cases, um, the advisor is restricted from maybe mentioning solutions that may be appropriate. At one large brokerage firm, for instance, the advisors are not allowed to talk about reverse mortgages, even if it was an appropriate vehicle for someone to use. Or we recently just published a paper in the Retirement Management Journal where we looked at, uh, it was a paper written by David Blanchett and Jason Fickner, where they looked at advisors and whether the degree to which they are recommending to their clients that they delay taking Social Security, but use their uh, IRAs or taxable accounts as bridge money in order to do the delay. And what they found was that in many cases, the advisor was not recommending that they delay in part because they did not want to lose the assets under management because that would result in a loss in income or revenue for them. So there are some structural challenges of the industry associated with taking care of people in retirement. Again, you mentioned this a few minutes ago. You know, that's the underlying challenge, right? What is the responsibility? And 
if the industry wants to continue to be the primary advisor to clients, because you know, I would say right now, especially looking at Gen Two, you know, the biggest competition financial advisors have in working with Gen Two is that Gen Two thinks they can do it themselves. And so there's a there's kind of a value inflection point here that I think is being driven by this retirement wave or this longevity crisis that's building for the the darker end of of the retirement. And organizations have to decide where they want to be. They are not geared generally. They're not structured generally to be able to serve from the client back in. They are generally organized the same way that they were put together in some cases 60, 80 years ago. And they haven't really changed. There's product and there's distribution. And in order to be able to solve problems for consumers, People like Jason and Finca and Blanchett are looking at all this and saying, it just doesn't work. And so it is that big of a deal, I think, to say it's time to restructure by focusing on what the output is going to be. In other words, the reliability of the solutions at the consumer level. That is not the way organizations are structured, and it is particularly difficult to do it right now because... I would say most financial advisors are coming off of 2023 that was the best that they've ever had. And so yeah. it doubles down the problem of how do you make a change when it's not obvious to everyone that a change is needed? There's no burning platform for change. And Well, that brings us to the question of disruptions. And, uh, and do you have any predictions about one or two disruptions that may be coming to the advice profession? Well, you'd have to guess, right? And you don't have to be a, you know, a scientist of rockets to figure this one out. But if if what we just talked about is that dysfunctional, it won't be that anything inside of a company or a competitor will will be that much dramatically better than the next competitor. It'll be a different format. So, one of the formats I would bet on is that there will be more and more money that stays in retirement plans, that's not coming out to feed a, a retail monster uh, or to pass to financial advisors. It's going to stay right there because there are uh, definitely economies of scale for the plan sponsor. They are the employer of the person. So whoever is still there thinks that there is some responsibility. It's a really good spot to be able to deliver services that people want. And there isn't any real pressure for anybody to buy anything because, you know, you are the plan sponsor. And so, you know, your role as a fiduciary is already baked. So why not just extend it? And I think there will be significant opportunities for plan sponsors to do that and make it easy for them. So companies that are supporting plan sponsors today, big administrators, are working on that for ways for people to remain in those plans and get a better service. But you can't... You, I mean, you can't in, in any way uh, discount the possibility that one of the big box stores, Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, gets better and better at being able to contact clients proactively because they have the right information and help guide the clients themselves into what I think is the second big disruption. Big disruption is not the big box stores. Fidelity's already got 51 million individual retail clients. You know, that ship has already sailed. Sorry. So the big point, though, is self-actualization. And so if people can't get somebody to do something for them, they're going to figure out how to do it themselves, and they're going to get an awful lot of help. And I think what we're going to watch here is something that's drafting pretty closely behind changes that have been made in another, in another model, which is restricted availability, which is personal health care. And we saw, the, again, with COVID, COVID was the wake-up call to the capacity issues and, and serviceability for the medical profession. You know, you ain't seen nothing yet. When you think about the aging population, it's going to be a significantly bigger problem. But some of the, uh, the capabilities that were built in response to COVID, even something as simple as vaccinations, you know, that turned out to be not a, a, something mandated through physicians, but actually was dropped into the for-profit world, into the big box stores of health like CVS or you know any of the, the monster uh, Walgreens uh, pharmacies and pharmaceutical companies participating. They created a different system for millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people to get service. And I think that you're going to see in the combination of the big box stores 
the uh, the competitive pricing around being a custodian. You know, have all of that stuff there, and people are going to be able to pick incrementally the way for the stuff that they want, kind of the way they buy that off-the-shelf healthcare today. Uh, you didn't mention AI as a disruptor. Is that a disruptor? It 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 is, but it's an enabler. You know, so it's it's not so much. I don't view it actually as a disruption as as much as I view it in that second model that I had of of client self actualization. They're going to be able to get all the information that they want. The trick is going to be the and and who will be responsible for delivering. That's why I, I point out some of the firms that would actually be in this game because they're already ready to go. All they have to do is to make sure that whatever the whatever the AI engine or whatever the chat is going to pull from, that, that all that information is solid. Because as you pointed out before, Bob, one of the things that's really tricky, and we did a lot of automated stuff at Fidelity, automated journeys and all that, you get into some spots where you can't let the you can't let the bot make the decision. So it's a it's an information delivery vehicle, but I think you find and, and I use Medicare as a really good example. You find that most people, even if they're really well schooled in, in financial issues, they want to make sure that that's the right decision. So they're they're not so much asking for the idea itself, but they are looking for the validation, and that's going to be a role for human beings forever. Yeah. Uh, one last question about disruption, Steve, is um, sometimes people have said, oh, the, the next competitor will be Amazon, Apple, uh, you name it, some you know large company that want, that could easily move into that world. That, any thoughts about that? Oh, sure. You know, Amazon's already there, right? So, yeah. you know, in the healthcare business, and I think, I still think the healthcare business is a little more complicated than the financial world. So, you know, but call me old fashioned. So, so the, the, when we say Amazon or Google, it's, it really, to me, means three different things. One is that they've got a name brand that is respected. It is fascinating to me to watch younger generations get comfort from a bank that will use an app for them to look at. Now, you and I, being kind of old fogies, would say, well, if if all your banking information's on your phone, you do realize that increases your risk, so maybe that's not the safest bank in the world. But for them, it's about the transparency of information, and that's where they're getting confirmation that the idea that they have has validation. So there is value in those iconic brand names now, now iconic brand names compared to some older brand names. So I think that's the first part, which is, why did I engage with you to begin with? Well, I trusted your name. Okay, so if that's Amazon, Google, and you think that that's trustworthy, then that's a start that other people are just not going to have. The second thing, though, is that they've already got information. They have a way to package that information. They are experts in using that information back at you with apparently you not having any problem with that. That is enormous. If every financial advisor working with every client had all the information that the client about the client's situation, they would, and they had it at their fingertips, and as you said before, a lot of the firms won't even let you use it, you can't solve problems. So here, they're information monsters, and they know how to package it, channel it, and use it correctly. That's the, the second thing. And the third thing is they're willing to invest. And that is such a big deal. It is not going to be a scramble for, hey, we have to fix this thing because we've got outflows. It's going to be because we're leaning in and we see an opportunity. So I think that's actually a foregone conclusion. Yeah, interesting. All right, I'm going to set my crystal ball aside for a second and, and talk about some practical, actionable advice for advisors who are feeling overwhelmed by the increasing complexity of retirement planning. Like years ago, we didn't have an HSA to worry about. We didn't have a Roth to worry about, right? We didn't we didn't have any of the things that are available today. What's What are the practical steps would you recommend that they take today to move the business, their profession in the right direction? Well, the first thing is if you are one of the last solo practitioners or sole practitioners, ask yourself how many freestanding doctors there are. The world of, of financial advice and retirement is so much more complicated than a single person would ever be able to pull off. The notion of being able to do this yourself even if you were sitting in your own office at a major wirehouse firm or something else, stop. Just just stop. Because unless you have a niche business that only focuses on a particular area of expertise that you have, you've got to be able to do this with a group. And 
There are ways to do that. You know, the hub and spoke set up in a lot of firms is one way to do it. But I've got to tell you that every place I go, pretty much, everyone is working in a team where in many cases, as you, as you know so well, you've got somebody who was the first one there. And they're the one that grew up with the investment side and moved from being a stockbroker to, to moving into managed accounts and becoming a consultant for the first time. This move is actually bigger and more complicated. But the good news is you can hire people to do this stuff. You've created the top line revenue generating opportunity of that family and the assets that they have. Everything that gets done from here is much more, I would say, I don't, I don't want to minimize this in any way, but each of these are tasks. So they are very defined tasks. They are generally very detail oriented tasks. But think about whether or not that it's whether or not it's appropriate for that hunter gatherer advisor that really is the one that is encouraged and has been grown in the current model of financial services in the US. <clears throat> that person is a hunter gatherer should not change. Their target should change a little bit, but you don't want them sitting down with pages and pages electronically of an application for long-term care or to understand which account to take out next. You don't want them doing that work. And I was with a, a bunch of, of, of advisors last week that are among some of the best hunter-gatherers in the world. And I said, we don't want you to change. What we want you to do is to put a support system around you so that you can cover all these issues and you can still be the one that challenges the family and engages them to take action. That is a gift that most people who will be helping out with some of those more specific task-oriented jobs, they wouldn't necessarily have the confidence or the bearing to be able to pull that off. So I think it's just, you gotta get help. Yeah. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, anything we missed or anything that just bears reemphasizing? Normalize aging. Everybody's getting older. Find an old person, give them a hug. So, you know, it's just what it is. The people that we see being the most successful right now are the ones that are sweating it less. They're just not getting hung up about it. They're leaning in, they're having conversations with clients, and it all starts from having an appreciation for people as they age. And it's really, really very interesting to me that the people we see who are making the greatest advances are the ones that have already had some kind of aging issue in their own family, and you know that so well yourself. Yeah. Um Obviously, uh, we haven't talked enough about how people can learn more about Next Chapter and what they can find by availing themselves of your resources. Can you talk a little bit about that before we wrap up? Yeah. So we keep most everything on the website. So it's nextchapterinnovation.com. And go in particular to our, our page or the tab that says Our Insights. And that's where we try to collect an awful lot of the work that we do. And then Advisorpedia uh, is our... That's our media partner for Next Chapter. And Advisorpedia is the fastest growing platform for information in the industry. What we like about them is that, led by Doug Hyken and former Schwab guy, is that they're reaching out and providing information so that you could access it if you're an advisor or if you're a consumer. So there are no walls. That's another observation that I have is that we've got to take down the walls. You know, tracking your cookies and, and having stuff behind a paywall or a login get over it. Let people have all the information. Let's all look at the stuff together because we're going to have to solve it together. Yeah, that's great. So uh, ex-Fidelity and ex-Schwab guy working together arm, arm in arm. Yeah, ironic, isn't it? <laughs> it's okay by me and it's okay to get rid of paywalls. I, I agree. Steve, I want to thank you for, so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. This article is great. This, this, our conversation at least to my way of thinking, has been great. I appreciate it ever so much. And hopefully you'll come back on to another uh, podcast when you write another article for The Monitor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe even before that, because that was a pretty long article. That's not, that's not usually my kind of thing. But, but, you, you, know, but you're a, you, my friend, are a legend. And so you know, wherever you go, I'm right behind you. All right. Count me in. Thank you for listening to the Exceptional Advisor podcast brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. For additional resources, updates on events, 
and exclusive membership deals. Visit www.investmentsandwealth.org. The Investments in Wealth Institute is proud to share a continued partnership with the Chicago Booth School of Business, now offering in-person education for the Retirement Management Advisor Certification. Expand your financial advising practice by demonstrating your ability to guide clients through the full retirement life cycle with the RMA Certification Program. The deadline to register is April 30th, 2024, so don't wait to join this in-depth program to become your firm's retirement planning expert. Register today at iwicentral.org slash RMA booth. program to become your firm's retirement planning expert. Register today at iwicentral.org slash RMA booth.